just uh, two things to point out for people. Um, when you have a question or comment, if you can make sure to speak into the mic, although we can all hear you within this room, it might not get recorded on the audio if you don't speak directly into the mic. And as well, for those of you who are planning on attending the weekend sessions, it hasn't been advertised explicitly, but all of the workshops on Saturday and Sunday, they're freely open to the public, so you're more than welcome to attend them. They'll be at York's Glendon campus, which is closer to downtown. Um, and with that, I guess we're ready to get started with this panel, which is entitled Questioning Natural and Community Capital. Uh, and today we are excited to have two keynote speakers. The first speaker to the far right of me, not ideologically, but <laughs> spatially, is uh, Justin Podur, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York. And Justin's scientific research focuses on forest fires in Canada, but he's also published widely on political conflicts and social movements. And uh, just as an endorsement, I think Justin has a new book coming out this month with uh, Pluto Press on the recent history of Haiti. And Justin's presentation will be entitled Nature, Capital and Commodification, Ecology and the Capitalist Power Framework. And to the immediate right of me, we have JJ McMurtry, who's also an associate professor uh, he's in the Department of Social Sciences at York, and JJ's research focuses on linking social, political, and economic theory with the practices of cooperatives and the social economy. And JJ's publications have focused on topics ranging from the ethics of fair trade to alternative forms of energy to cooperatives and uh, credit unions. And JJ's presentation is entitled uh, Community Capital, The Pitfalls and Promise of Local Power. And each speaker will have 25 minutes to present, and I will hold up a little sign when your time is up. Just let me get my timer. <laughs> and who wants to go first, I guess? Is it? I guess I'll go first. OK, Justin, doesn't, go ahead when you're doesn't ready. doesn't matter to me, so. Sure, I'll, yeah. <laughs> um, OK. Should I turn this off or something? Or, I don't know if it's a distraction. I don't have any PowerPoint or anything like that. Ah, oh, whatever. Um, okay. So I was just telling uh, Jonathan, it's a lot of fun to be here. It's, it's, it's really cool to be, um, I don't know, engaging with, a, with this kind of body of theory and ideas and, and see how different people uh, engage with it and, and have a different take on it. And I was rereading the, uh, the book, Capital is Power. Um, over the past few weeks, as I was preparing, and uh, and and so it's 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 really a, I don't know, it's really it, I I feel really good to be here and talk to people who are thinking about these things seriously and in a very trying to think about them in a in an original way. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I I did I don't have too much. I, what I want to do is mainly to provoke. Uh, people to think about how, how, in a, in a specific way, how to think about nature, um, how to think about ecology and ecological questions, and, and relate them to political economy and political economic ideas and frameworks. And that's specific. And then more generally, I think this can give us some insight into uh, into how to compare different theoretical frameworks and 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 how they apply. So, so what insights can we gain by looking at environmental and economic problems from different theoretical perspectives? So, first of all, maybe a few notes about theory. So. I think of this conference, part of the reason I was interested in participating or eager to participate is because this conference, like most economic work, I think, is an interested conference. It's not a natural order that we're trying to understand here. It's a social order. And it's not that we have some kind of neutral scientific desire to understand it. We want to understand it in order to change it. Uh, for the better. <laughs> so we're interested political actors. Um, among the things we have to do is take 
meaningful political action in accordance with our values. Um, among the things we have to do to do that, so we're out there trying to do meaningful political action, I think, or I hope. Um, I, I, I hope to try to do that myself. Um, but we have to, part of that work of figuring out what it is, what constitutes meaningful political action is, is theorizing. Um, deciding on a theoretical framework, deciding on what theories you, you believe. Um, and and that con the, the, the idea that we have to theorize, that we have to either come up with some theory of our own or, or understand what theories we hold or be at the mercy of other people's theories. Uh, Keynes said that, I think, um, a long time ago. That is enough of an answer to me for why theorize. Um, but it also, got the, the, the idea that we're guided by a desire to take meaningful political action in the world also guides the kinds of theory we're going to work with. And the reason that it guides the kind of theory we're going to work with is because all theories apply over some domain. So there's always some concept of a domain when you're talking about a theory. There, if a theory is a, I mean, you could summarize what a theory is in a lot of ways. I think of a theory as basically a set of claims. Um, so a set of claims applies over some limited domain. And one major theoretical mistake that's made often is to think that a theory applies over a wider domain than it actually applies. Um, more on that soon. So I raise these two notes because economic theories are very frequently interested, not merely disinterested scientific theories, but also because it's often unclear where the domain of economic theory ends and other theories should begin. So take Keynesian theory. Um, Keynesian economic theory is interested. Keynesians are always using their theory to try to advise governments, whether those governments are listening or not. They try to get governments to make policy in accordance with that theory. They have theories of how the government is supposed to intervene during a crisis, how a government is supposed to encourage saving during good times, um, deficit spending during bad times, stimulating demand, all of, these, all of these policies that Keynesians advocate because of their theory. Um, and, and classical economists or supply siders or whatever, they might argue that governments are irrelevant and markets are the most important thing but much of their theorizing is also ultimately about advising governments. They just have different advice. Um, so, so both of these frameworks, which are often uh, placed or thought of as in opposition, Keynesians or uh, Friedmanites, um, free marketeers and uh, liberal or you know, government, pro-government liberals, are, are put in thought of in opposition, but they're both fundamentally interested and they're both interested in advising governments. Um, and that's the domain of their theory. That's, what, that's most of what they're doing and that's most of why they're doing what they're doing. Marxists uh, today, I don't think a lot, of, a lot of Marxists don't really believe that there are governments out there looking for their advice. There might be one or two, um, but whether that's cause or effect, Marxists are, are often thought of as theorizing for deeper reasons. So they're, they're not producing theory for governments, um, they're, they're, but they are interested and they are doing it for political action. They're doing it to provide theory for classes of people who are going to overthrow these governments and institute a new form of society. That, that means it's a, it applies over a kind of a different domain. It's used to predict different things, and I actually think it's used to predict more things. It's kind of a bigger domain in, in some ways uh, than other economic theories. And one thing that I like about this framework that we're discussing at this conference is that it's kind of like Marxism in that it dreams big. It's trying to explain a big domain. It's trying to explain how the system works, how elites behave, what the nature of accumulation is, what it is that's accumulating. So, okay, so, so much for economic theory and domains. What about environmental studies or the domain of environmentalism, um, I guess, or e 
environmental, yeah, I guess I could say environmental studies. If you look at the, the literature where environment and political economy overlap, there's ecological economics and environmental economics. Um, I think of a lot of this literature as attempts to extend economic theories into a new domain. So a lot of uh, ecological economics, a lot of environmental economics, extends basically the classical framework of utility, um, the value coming from what humans, what society values. The, the quantitative framework is in terms of utils, demand curves, supply curves, uh, how we value nature, um, and trying to extend that to what in environmental economics is called natural resources, but that itself is a, is a specific way of looking at it, right? That, that term, calling nature natural resources, itself betrays a, a theoretical and interested framework. Um, what about on its own terms? So environmental studies deals with the relationship between society and the natural world, between the human and the non-human, between the biological and the ecological. So ecological is the relationships between living organisms, right? Um, and the social. So um, these domains meet at, at, in different ways. Again, depending on where you're coming from as an economist, you'll have a different take on environmental questions. So we can run down the list again. Keynesians uh, emphasize how sound environmental policy and regulation can lead to positive environmental outcomes. So they, they look at problems like climate change, depletion, pollution, and they look for solutions like Green New Deals, carbon taxes, regulation, slowing down the economy through financial transaction taxes, slow growth, policy solutions. So that's what a lot of the uh, green, you know, green Keynesians or green environmentalists, um, well, green environmentalists is redundant, but green, um, green left economists or green liberal e economists advocate. Um, then you can take classical economics. So classical economics interfaces with environmental studies and ecological economics. And here is where, and I, I have a little bit on this, but this is where I think a lot of the, this is where I think the frame, the capital is power framework becomes most useful in understanding the limitations of an existing body of economic theory, namely the valuation of natural capital. So there's a book, the, the popular book is by a guy named Paul Hawken. And the title of the book is called Natural Capitalism. Has anybody heard of it? If you've, OK. So people have heard of it. So natural capitalism is the idea that if we value cap nature as capital, if we understand that nature is productive capital from which all of our e economic activities uh, extend, if we can assign dollar prices to these um, natural endowments to the ecosystem services that they provide. So those are two uh, phrases from this literature. Natural capital, so nature is capital, and nature, natural capital provides ecosystem services. So ecosystem services include the air we breathe, the water we drink. Uh, these are all services that nature is providing us. And if we could understand how much these services were worth in dollar terms, then we could protect nature. Um, so there's the valuation of natural capital. That's a, that's a big part of uh, ecological economics. And, and um, there are different ways of doing this. People, I, I'm sure the economists in the room know, like there's the hedonic pricing method, the travel cost method. There's all these ways of try, doing what economists do, right? Classical economists, they try to figure out how much we value, how much pleasure we get from the environment in order to figure out what it's worth. Um, and there's no other concept of what it's worth uh, other than what we value in classical economics, so that's what we have, that's what ecological economics has to do. It has to try to figure out uh, 
what we, how much we value it, the utility functions for nature. Um, so valuation of natural capital. And then there's the creation of markets. So nature provides ecosystem services. Uh, and, and one key way in which we can find out how much pollution costs to society in this, in this framework, right, in this market framework, one way that we can find out how much we value breathable air or whatever, drinkable water, is to create markets for all of these things. So if, if something is in the market, then we find out its true price, then we find out its true value. If we can commodify um, these things, if we can find ways to bring them into the market, then we can understand their true value. That's the natural capitalism kind of framework, which I think um, you can already anticipate some of the problems with if you're familiar with the capitalist power framework, but I'll get to that. Um, now, Marxist environmentalists, they advocate eco-socialism. They basically argue that a socialist society would take better care of the environment than a, capital, than a capitalist society, which is destroying the environment. That's fair enough, I think, but I, I found in my own research about Marxist environmentalism that there is a lot more theorizing and theoretical work to be done there. There's a lot um, of specifics about eco-socialism uh, that need to be spelled out. Um, OK, so this is, these are, I've just described the areas where environmental and economic theories meet, depending on your economic, which economic theory you hold. Now, I think that whatever economic theory you hold, um, environmentalism, including if you're a, one of the growing number of global advocates of the capitalist power uh, framework, um, it, if, if uh, whatever theory you hold, I think that environmentalism can provide a number of very important insights to your thinking. Um, the first is uh, that there's a natural envelope in which all of our economic activities take place. Um, when we think about the economy, we think about something that's socially constructed. I mean, uh, the previous talks, I thought, especially the one on virtual worlds, but also on the economy of attention, it was, it, they, to me, they were, they were really, they really brought home to me the, the human aspect of it all, the specifically social, mental aspects of these things. But, but environmentalism tries to remind us that, that all of these activities take place in a, in a biological, physical reality. Um, we, are, we are social creatures, but we are also biological creatures who are interdependent with other life on the planet. And ignoring that reality, which a lot of economic theories do, is totally insane. Um, and and, and it's, it's easy to do. It's seductive to do. We can, get, we can get disconnected from this biological grounding in a lot of ways. And in fact, I think you know, Buddhism <laughs> helps us, helps is another way to kind of remind us that, hey, look down, you're a physical being as well as whatever else is going on. Um, so, so that is one very important insight. And, and how exactly that gets incorporated is, is up for grabs, I think. It's up for grabs in this framework. It's up for grabs in, in any economic framework. The second insight is on the question of value. So much of capital is power consists of an, a critique of existing economic theories of value. And I think that environmentalism adds to this question. So economic theory, ex existing, economic, ex existing economic theory says value is either the pleasure that people get out of things or the labor that humans put into things. Um, but, but do other life forms, environmentalism would ask, do other life forms not add value? Doesn't a lot of our economy come from plants and animals, past and present? If you define work as only things that humans do, aren't you missing a lot of the actual economic sphere? I think that you are. I think that environmentalism is right to suggest that you are. And again, there are differing views within environmentalism about how humans should value non-human life. There's 
there is an idea that humans are stewards of the natural world and have a responsibility to shape how the natural world um, evolves. There's another idea that, that nature basically belongs to us and we have to take care of it because, uh, because it's ours. There's another idea that, which is called deep ecology, which says that humans should just get out of as much of the ecosystem as we can and that ecosystems do best without human um, interference. So again, there's a range of, of, of ideas. There's active debates among environmentalists about what the relationship should be and how we should think of what nature does and how nature relates to our economic activities. But we can't ignore it. Nobody who thinks of economic questions should ignore the relationship between society and nature. Um, that would be a mistake. OK, so let's say, let's try to move forward with those two insights. One, that there's a natural envelope, and two, that there's a, an important uh, relationship between and dependence of society on nature. What about this framework? What about capital as power? What can capital as power add to environmentalism? What insights can capital as power provide in thinking about environmental questions or environmental economic type questions? Well, I think it has a few important implications for environmentalists who are thinking about political economy. So capital as power uses Veblen's concepts of uh, absentee ownership and strategic sabotage and Mumford's idea of the mega machine and social control. Both of these have important implications and they're taken further in the, in the book, as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, according to capital is power, capital is not a stock. Capital is power, specifically power to sabotage industry in the interests of business. So, so looking at nature this way, whatever nature is, it's definite, whatever role it plays in the economy, it's definitely not capital. It's definitely not um, capital because it's not, because capital is not a stock. Um, capital is something else. Now nature, I think anyone who watches the news knows that nature has the power to sabotage industry. But it's not strategic sabotage, right? It's, I, I don't think so. I mean, unless you want to get spiritual about it. I mean, you know, even if we want to make concessions to the spiritually minded, we can, we can, we can say that uh, it's not, it can't do strategic sabotage in any way we mortals can understand. Um, the social machine that capitalists seek power over depends on nature in many fundamental ways, but nature does not accumulate, right? Nature. I mean, nature can grow, but it can't, it's not an accumulative uh, agent the way capitalists are. So um, capital as power uses this term creorder to, to describe a kind of society. And in this current creorder, everything is subordinate to accumulation. So in this context and with this theoretical understanding, carbon markets and natural capital valuation um, can be viewed as political proposals that are trying to make conservation of nature uh, compatible with accumulation. So, so I, view, I view a lot of these green capitalist um, ideas as kind of uh, people who are trying to say, well, capitalism is with us forever. We've got to find ways to make it possible to save nature given that capitalism is with us forever. And so, so look, nature is capital. <laughs> we've got to save capital, right? So we've got to save nature. So uh, I, I, I see a lot of these things as political uh, proposals and political adaptations um, to make conservation compatible with accumulation. But is it compatible? Um, I think that it, it, nature can be protected and stewarded and cared for as long as these things don't interfere with accumulation in our system. But it's also clear that they will inevitably interfere with accumulation. So there's another field um, of environmental economics, which is called bioeconomics. Do people, does that ring any bells for people? Clark, Colin Clark. So Colin Clark has this very insightful kind of 
example that he uses, which blew my mind when I read it as a student because it was so simple and so impressive. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. But suppose that you have a natural resource, a school of fish or a forest or something like that. And you, it's under private ownership. And it's growing. So the number of fish in your pond, the number of tree, the, the size of the amount of wood in your forest is growing at 2% a year. Very respectable rate of growth from a biological perspective, given all of the changes and shocks and things that could um, affect it. Well, if it's growing at 2% a year and the interest rate is 1% a year, perfect. You, you, are, you are, as a good capitalist, you're earning uh, a good return above the normal rate <laughs> in, uh, in these terms. If the interest rate goes or the normal rate of return goes to 3% a year, what's the rational thing for a capitalist to do? Cut down all the trees, sell the lumber, and put the money in the bank. So the minute, so that means that under private, private ownership, any ecosystem that's, that's, that's growing or that, that is part of some economic um, enterprise whose growth rate goes below the normal rate of return, it's basically doomed. Um, and if you, if you think about that, that means that in the long run, <laughs> everything is basically doomed. And, and so with one simple, and there's, there's, there's many more things that can bring about this uh, destruction than just the normal rate of return. But if the normal rate of return alone is enough, we have a pretty big problem. Right? So um, just to conclude then on a research note, so, so there's, um, there's these, we were talk I started by talking about the political, uh, the role of theory in political action, but, but I also think that trying to make these comparisons and, and look at where these theories meet, we can also find out where we need additional theoretical work. Um, I, think, I think that trying to use the capital as power framework with environmental studies reveals a few important gaps in our theories, the ones that I mentioned about how a, how a, how a, what a good relationship between society and nature looks like in the economic context, I think is still a, an unclear question. Um, but also, it also raises to me the idea like I, I'm looking for theories to identify vulnerabilities and possibilities for change and redistribution of power for getting people together who want a just world that can make room in practice and in theory for both human and the non-human. And I think uh, paying attention to both of those things when we're theorizing about the economy can only be good. That's all. Thank you. OK, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm JJ McMurtry um, here at York University. And I'm going to talk uh, about my research, and particularly a piece of work that I'm putting together now on uh, uh, cooperatives, and more importantly, cooperative theory, and trying to push cooperative theory and the economic practice, scare quotes around economic, of cooperatives into a larger theoretical framework. And in that sense, I'm approaching capital power as a fellow traveler. I've known about the theory for a while. I'm sympathetic to it. But I also have some questions that I want to ask. And part of what I'm doing is to ask the question of the Control-Alt-Delete, which is suggested in a recent article, uh, about thinking of alternatives, trying to conceptualize ways in which we can see alternatives emerging. And I note that in this afternoon, there's lots of conversation around this, including uh, Tim, uh, Jonathan, and Shimshan's paper about power from below. So I hope, in some ways, this is a fellow traveler to that idea. I'm going to try and do four things, which I know is ambitious in 25 minutes. So I apologize. But I've tried to write out the PowerPoints in a way that the argument appears in a logical way. And I'm happy to share that or talk about it in questions afterwards. But essentially, I'm going to try and raise a problem of theory, a problem of the concept of community, and a problem of history. 
I'm going to take that to talk about a problem of motivation for change, and specifically about the blockages to change that have happened in an intellectual way through both liberal theory and Marxist theory, and conceptualizing ways of resisting capitalism. I'm going to try and talk about cooperatives as something very practical, not idealizing them, but thinking about them as a vehicle for creating community capital as an alternate site of power. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the promise and pitfalls of localism. So probably most people here are familiar with the capitalist power framework, but I wanted just to say here are three things that I see as very useful for this questioning about where do alternatives come from. The first is the refusal in uh, capitalist power to separate economics and politics alongside of, a, uh, of, I think, a very clear rejection of economics as simply a series of scientific laws. Two, the idea of differential accumulation as a motivator of individuals and organizations in capitalism is both recognized and critiqued as not a satisfactory way to organize the social world. And three, the idea that power itself is capitalism's motivation, which in turn requires a creordering of society. Now, for me, what's important about this is that we can take the issue or the concept of alternatives to capitalism forward because we're moving away from this realm of scientific understanding, quote unquote, of economic laws, and we're moving back, and I would argue that this is a, an old tradition, but back into the realm of the social, where things are up for debate. We are seeing creordering happening, and we can resist creordering. It is not just that the laws are abstractly operating off in the distance somewhere that we have to wait, as some Marxists famously have argued, for the right time. This is actually an active and already, always already happening occasion. So the key question for me, given this framework, is how is the process of capitalization resisted? And I think that here again, I'm a fellow traveler with the capitalist power framework in that, and this is quoting from the, the recent article, that the bearers of radical transformation need to do two things. Understand the concrete challenges of capitalist power, and I think there's been a lot of work done, and I think we'll talk a bit about that in some of the areas where I think it can be expanded, but I think there's, I'm in general agreement. I'm more interested in this two point, and those brackets are mine, on being able to negate this process by creordering a humane democratic alternative. How is that process happening and how can we think about it? And importantly, is there something happening now that we can see? So for me, the first problem of theory, and it's not a problem specifically with capitalist power, it's a problem with theoretical frameworks of the left generally, is that we tend to see capitalism, capitalization, as a system of, in this case, power, but a system that we look at as sort of totalizing itself throughout history. And for the other, which I'm using as a shorthand for movement of opposition, while this is very important to understand this, and I'm not trying to minimize that, the question for creating alternatives is really, how does capital do this? We know it's doing it and I think the work is pointed out very well, but how is this happening? And I want to focus on one of these pieces, which comes out in the capital of power framework as well as others, which is this concept of private ownership, which in some ways has really disappeared from the discourse as an important theoretical framework. Why is it important? For me, it's important because it opens a discourse on alternatives. If this is the how, if this is how capitalization happens, then we can start to say, well, what would we do different than that in order to create alternatives. And I want to argue throughout the rest of my, my presentation here that alternative and collective power, importantly democratically collective, is one of those means where private ownership is countervailed. Second problem of theory. And here I think I have more of a substantive debate. And that is that I think capitalist power recognizes, rightly, that economics should not be separated from the political. But the question of economics is a larger question than just capitalization or the process of capital emerging in history. There is alternate economics 
that are always already happening, no matter what the regime is, feudal, if we take that very broad category. And we need to have a definition of economics. I've just provided my own here, which is fairly standard, that is recognizing that economics, if we define it this way, efficiently or efficient production, distribution, and consumption of goods otherwise in short supply, is always already a political problem, is always already a question of power. Capitalism has created a mystique over top of it to pretend that it's separate. And in this, I totally agree with the capitalist power framework. But we also have to revive a conception of how are we going to produce for need? How are we going to create accumulation, societal accumulation, as they say there, or production for need? And how do we organize that? Because with only a conception of capital and capitalization as an, in a negative sense, we don't have an alternate to place at the, quote, Marxism, the base of society, right? How are we going to produce for need? This is an urgent question, and one which I think needs to be directly addressed. We then have a problem, which is more of my own problem with my framework, is the problem of community. Sorry, I dropped my microphone. Who is the agent of social change that we are looking towards when we are trying to think of radical social transformation? And here again, and I don't want to argue at all throughout this talk, I want to be very clear that community is a very problematic concept. I don't have enough time to go into all the literature about communities of identity, communities of geography, communities of interest. But we need to be able to identify a space where alternatives can occur. And I just put two quotes up here, again, from that recent paper, which I think are indicative of the problem of conceptualizing alternatives in that we totalize capitalism. Counter-systematic movements remain hostage to the very capitalist cosmology they contest. I think that's largely true. But there are also other forms of resistance which are creating alternatives, as I'll argue later. More importantly, capitalism is the most universalizing mode of power. All, and that's my problem here, get quantified, capitalized, and integrated into the mega machine of capitalist power, which I think is absolutely the dominant mechanism that's happening in society. But when we focus on this, we do not see the alternatives as they emerge. It closes off the theoretical and conceptual space for this. Now, I want to be clear. I am not at all suggesting a vanguard type movement. I don't think capitalist power is suggesting such a thing. But I want to say that the idea of community, as problematic as it is, is central to the possibility of alternatives. And it's central not because it's a pure category, or an ontological category, but as a logical space, a counterweight to the process of capitalism and capitalization. What does capitalism do? It's universalizing, centralizing, and privatizing. Community opens up a space for a diversity, a democracy, and a collectivity, which is, by its very nature, in opposition to those fundamental frameworks of capitalism. The question that I want to turn to now, however, is how do we motivate that? If theory has mistakenly not looked at this or has not re recognized it, we need to be able to think, and I think capitalist power is a useful framework for this, of thinking about how do we think of people being motivated to create change, to resist this universalizing capitalism that we see all around us. And I think the talks earlier today were very good at pointing out the ways that it's constantly invading areas of life. I'm trying to say, well, where is the resistance happening? And part of that, for me, emerges in the way that we conceptualize history. The other of history as, as is pointed out in many schools, urbanization and capitalization, we get fascinated with its totalizing process. And I think, like Leinbaugh's historical books of recent, uh, The Many-Headed Hydra or the Magna Carta Manifesto, are interesting histories of alternatives that are emerging and struggling and rising and falling in opposition to this capitalism as it emerges. And what this tells us is that this process towards, or transition, and I've always hated this idea of feudalism to capitalism as if it's a singular, it's a actually quite complex historical process full of potential for alternatives. And you can see some of them in my third point up there that I've mentioned, 
concepts that we've lost. The guild's idea of the community chest. Guilds are often seen as the forerunners of capitalism, and yet each one had a community obligation and a collectivization of capital through the community chest written into their very charters. Or the democracy of the commune, which democratized economic as well as political spheres and tied those two together. Historically, then, we have a theoretical foundation for community capital, which I'm thinking of here as democratized and collectively managed capital for human need. Two more slides on history moving really quickly through. The democratization of capital doesn't cease in this transition period. In fact, it exists alongside of the classic proletarianization of the workforce. And it exists, most importantly, as I'll talk about in a bit, in the cooperative movement, but also lots of other spaces. E.P. Thompson, for example, mentions Rochdale in his uh, famous book, The Making of the English Working Class, but he just says, and it will disappear in this larger totalizing opposition. And what's important is in the failure of Robert Owen's Lanark, which is where the Rochdale pioneers came, came a rejection of the idea of paternalism and the idea of community control of capital, which is often overlooked, democratic control and limits on capitalism. In fact, we can see the emergence of cooperatives as the corporation, as was mentioned earlier today, the psychopath that is the corporation. It's the unheralded other, as I've written in another piece. It's economic in the sense that I'm talking about before, but it's collective and democratically owned. And I will get to critiques of cooperatives. Don't worry, I don't have the idea that they're the vanguard of a new movement. But they are strongly international in presence, spread around the world before international corporations really took hold in their present form of the limited liability corporation, which really emerges in the 1890s. They have clear value principles and a clear historical practice. And also, I think that we can see just sites that I've recently visited from Venezuela to Kerala, in Ontario and Emilia Romagna, a counter space of community capital as opposed to capitalization, where actually there is a taking back of space or a holding on to space in a democratic and collective way. So for me, this idea of anti-capitalism, which comes out again in a recent article about the 1% and the 99%, it's colored by this lack of recognition of the possibilities carried within history, as I've just mentioned. Capitalism, because of its privatizing and privatized nature, is fundamentally challenged by collective ownership. Not completely, but it is fundamentally. But I want to look at capitalism as a process, the capitalization process, and it can be challenged, not by a vanguard, but by alternative processes which allow people to build those alternatives in space and social convening. So if capital power is correct, that power is the motivation for capitalization, I want to argue, then the social question, as I've been saying throughout, becomes what alternative motivation exists to encourage cooperation? Where do we find the space that we can say, well, this is an alternate motivation that we can build, or at least see building, of an alternative. And I want to turn quickly here to a book, The Spirit Level, which has recently come out because I think it's important and it's an easy site. There's lots of other research here. But what I like about it is it articulates in painstaking detail a very important fact, or series of facts, the social nature of human motivation as an alternative and they go through what are, on the surface, counterintuitive examples, such as teen pregnancy or recycling. And they say, we can show, over time, that there's a strong correlation to societal equality or inequality, and depending on which case, not someone's real income. And these problems or good behavior, social behavior, occur according to the presence or lack thereof of equality. So in the case of recycling, the more equality there is in a society, measured in various ways, which you can look at their book, but if there's more equality, then there's more recycling. It's not rich neighborhoods versus poor neighborhoods. It's purely about, in their argument, or not purely, but it's mostly about equality. 
And what I want to get at here is the idea of a social differential accumulation, which I think capitalist power points to. That's the motivation for differential accumulation. But there is a flip side to that, which is that people want social belonging. And the way that we can resist that differential accumulation for power over others is to create these conditions of equality, which create a space for that resistance. So Wilson and Pickett, importantly, conclude that consumerism itself and the whole commodity form is driven by inequality. You consume more when you have more inequality. Doesn't mean everybody's consuming. Some people don't have access to consumption. But inequality breeds further consumption. Equality, that's a quote there from them, a great deal of what derives consumption is status competition. But what limits consumerism and the penetration of the commodity, and this is true in all sorts of marketing discourse, who purchases the least? People who feel secure and safe in their existence. Generally, older white men with professional careers who feel that they have a sense of community. Once you divorce, you start to consume again. This is a very interesting argument. And I've just given it the label status cooperation. But it's statistically demonstrable. So I want to turn now to cooperatives. And again, I'm not looking at them as the ideal type. I'm looking at them, as I'll say in a slide in a second, as sites of learning of this other social framework. But it's important to look at a few figures. For example, the $1.5 trillion in assets that credit unions have. And importantly, compared to, as The Economist says, $700 trillion in paper, $162 trillion in assets. It's a small number, but the assets that they're dealing with tend to be what some people call life goods, things that people use in a day-to-day -day way and actually are an important mechanism for creating security for people to see another alternative. Four in 10 Canadians are members of a cooperative, a billion people worldwide. And while there is, and this is a huge problem which I'm trying to fill in, but there is little aggregate research on cooperatives and equality. The thesis about cooperatives and equality and anecdotal evidence is very strong. And there's some really interesting work coming from the Eurixi Center in Italy around this type of idea led by a couple of economists, Carlo Borzaga being one of them. It's also important to remember that the state is a site, and I'm just going to quickly mention it, that of social and economic struggle around this attempt to create another social reality. In Ontario, for example, the FIT 2.0 legislation, I don't know if people are aware of it, but it's where there is legislation now which 1.0 was changed to 2.0 to say that a set aside of 200 megawatts for only for cooperatively owned alternative power. It's an odd thing in legislation, especially as the Ontario government signing deals with Samsung and other people for the privatized deregulation of its public power. It is also including this little set aside, which is increasing over time. And there's organization about co collecting that 200 megawatts and getting more by collective community power. And what I want to say here is just that this push for equality can see the state as an important facilitator, not just of capitalist power, but also of alternatives. But really, my big point here is that it's not just the figures. I don't want to fixate on the figures. It's actually the learning process that happens in cooperation, which is important. They are flawed organizations, and I'm sure there'll be questions about this afterwards, uh, in many cases. But there is social learning that happens. And if capitalism is this process towards private and exclusionary ownership of the means of production for profit or differential accumulation, then we might think about cooperation as a process towards the democratization and collectivization of capital for member or community benefit. It's not complete, it's not perfect, but it opens the terrain for this kind of discourse and learning to occur. And what I see within capitalist power is really useful is try an attempt to articulate a process-based alternative. There's a call for an alternative to capital. And I'm trying to provide 
a vehicle whereby we can at least start to measure and see and challenge my thesis um, by looking at cooperatives and democratized community capital. There are pitfalls, however. And the first is the very premise on which capitalist power is based. And I don't want to minimize it. That the rigorous logic of differential accumulation can infiltrate, or as I have up there, militate against equality and change, including in co-ops, and it is never just simply defeated by structuring a co-op. It's actually an active learning process that has to happen because it's a dominant discourse and occurs from outside. So the question then for me becomes, how do we facilitate a broad-based control, alt, delete of internalized logics of capitalist power within these organizations? And I'm not sure that I have a full answer, but I think that's a real pitfall. We have to think about that. How do you institute in the practices of these organizations, mechanisms whereby this can happen. So for me, rooting capital and community is only the start of a larger process, but it is a hopeful space for that to happen. As I mentioned, the logics of differential accumulations have become culturally embedded and are a real challenge to this type of idea, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't think it, measure it, and start trying to build it. There are also larger scale problems. State and regulatory hostility is a major roadblock, and Fisco is the Financial Services Commission in Ontario, and just as a quick aside, they have the regulatory right over every incorporation of a cooperative in the province, which is very odd, but actually quite meaningful <laughs> if we take the capitalist power framework seriously. But also challenges to capital are often met with force, as we can see around the world when there's alternatives that are attempted to be built. Really quickly, there's also, and importantly, real appropriation of community capital by capitalism itself along this line. And I don't want to minimize it. You can think of Jeffrey Sachs, microcredit discourse, which is you know, spurious, uh, especially Euclos and other people. Social enterprise discourse, very popular in English Canada. And all of these really try to talk about an empowered poor we can empower them to take care of themselves really as a vehicle for capital accumulation. And obviously there's the dismantling of the welfare state in the name of localism, as I mentioned in the case of alternative energy, which is a parallel process which we cannot ignore. Last slide. Despite all of these pitfalls, however, I want to argue that there's potential or at least a reason to look and turn research towards the alternative and turn research towards a democratic ownership of capital in a collective and community way. I argue that because I think that there's this motivational question that I mentioned with the spirit level, as well as an on the ground movement that exists that can be useful to test this hypothesis. They are not at all well researched, but they are the best researched vehicles, cooperatives that is, and we have to look at those and others and ask the question of whether or not there is this differential motivation within them. And my final point, which is really the motivation for this talk, is that the log logic and language of capitalism, when we analyze it, it's hugely important. But it also distracts often from research into the diverse alternatives and the way we build ourselves out of this, which is at least for me, my personal interest. I look forward to your questions and your comments. I've just put my email up there in case you want to email me for any reason. Uh, send your insults, your, <laughs> your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you both for those uh, very interesting presentations. We've got about 15 minutes now for questions. I'll just open up the floor, I guess, to two or three questions, and we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, this question is for... Justin, um, so I, I really like the fact that you brought up ecological economics, and I think one of the main discourses in ecological economics is criticizing growth, economic growth. Um, and one of the things I wanted to ask you is about, uh, if we think about uh, capital as power, is the difference between a, a zero-sum world and a positive-sum world. So. If we have economic growth, at least in theory, the economic pie is getting bigger. Uh, 
So if we have accumulation, differential accumulation, at least possibly, you know, the rich can get richer, but the poor might get a little bit better off, possibly. Uh, in ecological economics, they say, well, and I'd be one of them, growth is, is insane on a finite planet. It can't continue forever. So we want either a steady state economy or maybe degrowth economy. But that seems to be a fundamental contradiction with differential accumulation, because then you're in a zero-sum world. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer by default. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, your thoughts. Any other questions? Uh, one question for each uh, person. So uh, first for um, Mr. Poder. Um, what is the significance, uh, if any, of the second demographic transition and a possible decline in the global population? Um, uh, and it, it actually keys directly off the question from the person in front of me, whose name I don't know, I'm sorry. And then the question for uh, Mr. McMurtry would be, could you comment, please, on um, what seemed to me to be the related, uh, if somewhat older, arguments about um, uh, pension capitalism that uh, Peter Drucker circulated in the 1950s and that also had a left variation in places like uh, Scandinavia with wage earner funds. Thanks. All right. We'll take another question from Jeffrey Herod here in the second row. Thank you. My, my question or my comment is, is to uh, JJ. I don't know what your first uh, name is. Uh, when you were coming to the pitfalls of um, community and cooperatives, I was expecting you to mention something about the ethnic and religious intensity of localism mm -hmm. and of uh, cooperatives. Uh, some many years ago, I did research on one of the most successful cooperatives uh, that existed in Europe at the time, which was the Mondragon mm -hmm. Cooperative in the Basque Country. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we found that the motivating force was that they were Basque and that they were going to make right. this thing work to show how good they were in relation to mm -hmm. the Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of evidence that that happens in the case of the Rabobank in the Netherlands, for example. Mm -hmm. It was basically fundamentally the, the, her, her reformed church that was behind that. Mm -hmm. So I think that one has to be a little bit uh, cautious here that you, uh, when uh, researching you don't eliminate the, those uh, factors. But I would like to your comment on it, thank you. All right, we'll just um, allow the presenters time to respond to those questions, and then we'll take some more. Yeah. Let me go first. OK. So just really quickly, uh, I was supervising a, a thesis to the first question around public banks um, and, and also the idea of the transition of economy to basically a worker-owned economy that the Swedish model is the one I'm most familiar with, was trying to do uh, in that period in the 60s and 70s and, and failed. But I think it failed for political reasons, but partially because it was a very dangerous model. And also because I think that, again, what I don't like about that particular model was the way that it was pushed from the state, essentially, uh, as opposed to having uh, a worker uh, or member driven uh, logic to it. So I think what's interesting about it is it put a real limit on capital and worked forward it had a plan to basically turn over all businesses through profitability into worker owned organizations but i think that the the logic at that at that level is so strong to resist that kind of activity that it was almost doomed to fail what's interesting to me is that nobody or very few people talk about that model anymore uh, as a possible alternative and i think it's quite curious in terms of the, the question, I absolutely agree with uh, the ethnic and religious, but there's also, and I, I don't at all want to minimize it, but there's also evidence, uh, especially, for example, in so-called developing countries, Africa being the one where I know the literature the best, where co-ops have actually been instrumental in bringing together different religious groups, partially because they provide both an object for people to work together where they see a real opportunity, but also an object to work through particular interests. 
And I was at Mondragon just two years ago on my sabbatical. Uh, and I agree with you. There's a very, <laughs> obviously a very strong Basque component. But one of the things that's quite interesting that they're trying to deal with, and it's in their literature, it's on their website if you want to look at it, is they've internationalized, which is a really interesting problem. And I approach it from, ah, now we have the logics of capitalization emerging in an industrial cooperative. But what they, they say and what they've actually, they're demonstrating now through their university, uh, and I'm a little suspicious, but I'll give it its best version, is that in actual fact, they're trying to cooperativize and localize those branch plants. And so in China, they've been kicked out of two or three locations because they were actively engaging in worker ownership discussions inside of the, the Chinese context inside of these you know, work areas where there's mass factories producing particular things. And that discourse was seen as very dangerous, so they were removed. Um, and also that attempt to localize out, uh, meaning that it's not going to all be centralized, that we actually turn power over. The problem is, is that for whatever reasons, and I can go into those details with you uh, later, but they actually have not had very good success, except in India. There's been a little bit of success, but in Brazil, no success. Uh, in other countries in Asia, there's been no success. And they have a very racialized understanding of why other people don't <laughs> want to cooperate in their model. Uh, so it is actually an important piece that, I'm, but I don't think it's necessary. The reason why I didn't bring it up, I don't think it's necessary to the idea of cooperation as being a democratization and a collectivization of capital. It's just in practice, as often happens in numerous practices, other cultural logics impose themselves. But thank you for the question. OK, so um, let's do the population first. The population and environment is a long <laughs> debate <laughs> since, uh, you know, whatever, for, for a long time, since the 70s at least. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's ever been obvious. So, so there are, there's this famous equation that environmentalists use and teach. It's impact equals P times A times T. So P is population, A is affluence, and T is technology. So if you, I, it's not a real equation <laughs> if anyone's mathematically minded because there's no units and it's sort of meaningless. But the idea is that um, there's, there's also this concept of an ecological footprint, right? So if you live in Canada, your ecological footprint in terms of the energy you use and the water you use and the materials you use is much higher than if you're in the Congo or Haiti or, or India. So, so one, one person here ha does much more environmental damage than, one, than 10 people in Haiti or something, right? So, so, so the relationship, of, but having said that, most environmentalists do think that it's impossible for population to continue to expand. It's not expanding, as you've pointed out, and it, the rates of growth are coming down and so on. Um, and then there are debates among people who say, okay, well, if the population is, is, should stabilize at some point, if we do have to make room for non-human life and, and not kind of appropriate every inch of land and biomass and, and resource for humans, then how do we go about it? And then there are examples of very humane, almost accidental uh, ways in which population growth declines. You were in Kerala. I'm from Kerala originally. Uh, that's a case where most people think that, that in, in a very poor context, um, even a kind of unequal context, there's female literacy alone uh, basically reduced fertility tremendously because women get this sense that they have opportunities and, um, and they're empowered to make more decisions. So, so certainly um, there's a whole field of study and, and questions and, and interesting thinking to do and that has been done about the question of population and environment and I think economy. But I don't think there are any easy, I, I would just say like resist the easy answers like the population bomb and that kind of stuff, I don't, I never accepted. And a lot of critical scholars never accepted, right? Feminists have always been super critical of, of that kind of approach to, to things. On um, growth. So this is, this is again a case where I think capitalist power is helpful because they have this um, concept of breadth, a breadth regime versus a depth regime. So in a breadth regime, you're doing lots of what we would call growth, what mainstream economics would call growth. In a depth regime, there's not much growth, but they're still uh, accumulating relative to each other, even though it might be a depression. I think in, a, in, in both of these regimes, there are ways that 
the environment gets destroyed. So, so wealth, in, wealth creates environmental destruction, but so does poverty, right? People cut down trees in order to uh, fuel, you know, get a scrap of fuel to cook a scrap of food. Like there's all kinds of uh, specifically poverty and displacement induced environmental problems. On the other hand, there's also uh, the depletion and pollution because of wealth. So, um, so, so, but to the kind of getting to the heart of your question about uh, w whether growth is possible, whether indefinite growth is possible, um, I do think that, you know, classical economists can say yes because it's growth of pleasure, right? Like it's, it's just growth of utility is just pleasure. So if, grow, if pleasure just keeps growing, that's not really a problem. Um, Marxists might say, well, you can keep putting work on top of work and that's not really a problem either. Uh, environmentalists say no because what we're consuming is ultimately the earth. Um, but if, if we can get a handle on what it is that's growing, right? That's what capitalist power is about. It's saying, what is it that's accumulating? Um, and, 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 what, and, and, what is it, and what is it that's accumulating is actually a more precise question than what is it that's growing. Um, and, and I actually don't know the answer. I actually don't know. But, I, but the fact that I don't know means I, is, is, I think, I know something, which is to say, I don't think a lot of environmentalists will say growth is impossible. But I actually think it's important to, to think about and really understand what it is that's, that's growing. And until we have a handle on that, I don't think we can answer that question. Um, it seems to me that increasing technological sophistication, increasing human satisfaction, increasing equality, is all innovation, um, is all possible. Um, I, but I don't, uh, I don't think in incre constantly increasing uh, destruction of, of the land base, the ecosystem, other human, other non-human life forms is, is desirable or, or, or possible. So. Okay. Uh, we're technically out of time, but I guess we can go about five uh, to ten minutes overboard. Uh, for those of you who still have questions, if you can keep your questions um, as brief as possible and maybe the responses as well, we'll, we'll take another five to ten minutes. Metaphor of overboard. Yes, I'm, I meant overboard. <laughs> yeah, we can go overboard. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go overboard would be my advice. But, um, so we'll start back, back here. Mike's not on. It's on. No, it's on. We're hearing it. Oh. Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. First of all, thanks both for your presentation. My question is how we can put into practice ecological economics and local power. Because we know capitalism and corporation have the big, big institution that is in the states with the police, the armies, and the judge, right? They put down every resistance. For example, during G20 in this city, Right? The police, you know, treated us so badly, and the government called us terrorists. So how we can put into practice against these institutions, right, that it's, it's supported by capitalism? How we can put into practice? Thanks. Okay, I think Troy, we'll go Troy, Jonathan, Peter, and that's unfortunately all the questions we can take. Uh, one of the, one of the, central mechanisms that capital's power focuses on is capitalization and the the power of capitalization to make literally everything commensurable so all of the world's exactly. diversity becomes commensurable which is yeah. an extremely powerful mechanism and i think that the the activist resistance response has tended to be that this quantification in and of itself was a problem. Yeah. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the role and the danger of quantification for resistance if we instead see the problem as being how the, how the models of quantification get designed by those who have a particular interest and then how the decision making based on those quantities occurs. So is there a role for quantification? And it's a question for both of you. Peter down here, right in the front row. Um, 
I was, uh, I'm just wondering, when we talk about the, uh, the social economy and the, the cooperative movement, I thought it was very interesting to bring in the spirit level thesis. Uh, you know, it's so pivotal to so many of the discussions, including the ecological discussion, of course. Um, and I, I wonder if you can think of any examples of a social economy experiment where, because of the focus on the process as well as the outcomes, where the spirit level thesis has been vindicated in the sense that the economic activity is embedded in a new articulation of the good life. Because that, in a sense, is what we are looking for um, in new experiments or you know, new uh, forms of economic activity that uh, can potentially re replace the, the current capitalist model. How would you define the good life as he's walking over to John? <laughs> Okay. Yes. Oh, oh. Yeah. I, I, I had in mind mm -hmm. was a, a, a model that would begin to counter some of the pathologies mm. that you uh, yep. linked to the okay. pathologies um, as illustrated in the spirit level piece. Okay. All right. Whoever wants to begin. Justin, if you want sure, to okay. respond. Um, quantification, I think, is uh, it's something I've thought about like my whole life. Uh, and I, I, I do have a problem with it. I don't think it's just a matter of uh, bad quantification versus good quantification. I think it's a question of the domain. So if you, if you try to measure something and you measure the wrong thing, you measure, there, are, there are things that, that um, yeah, there are lots of things that I don't think can be measured. Utility <laughs> is one of them. Right, I mean, the the, the part of the part of why this whole framework I, is developed I, was developed, I think, was was be, in response to saying you can't measure uh, abstract labor units, you can't measure uh, utility, um, so so it doesn't mean very much to build a whole house of cards on these unmeasurable quantities, and a lot of pseudoscience is like that. A lot of pseudoscience is based on measuring something that's totally irrelevant. And, and building your building your house of cards on building a whole belief system on that, um, and 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 I think that quantification gives you a, a really false sense of of understanding. Like you think you because you can measure it, you think you understand it, you think you can control it, and a lot of especially as as it relates to the relationship between society and nature, that's a that's a mistake. So, so I guess what I think, I do think that quantification means if you can actually measure it, it does mean you understand it. I just think that if you, if you apply that standard, you would realize that a lot of things can't be quantified because we don't understand them well enough to quantify them. And so I, I think that kind of humility makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of the most best specified uh, quantities in nature, like the speed of light or um, you know the charge of an electron, are incredibly small, <laughs> um, small things compared to uh, ecological problems and serious biological problems that that don't have that kind of certainty associated with them. Uh, the how question, I, 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 there's a lot to say about that, of course, but I would just say that. If you're thinking strategically about how to change things in society, you shouldn't, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, or that's, that's too harsh. Um, it, it's, it's, it's better to think of what you're doing wrong than to think of we lost because of the other side. Like the other side is always gonna be there. The police are always gonna be there. The capitalists are always gonna be there. The media is always gonna call you names. Your strategy has to take all of that into account. And you know, you, you mentioned the G20. I, you know, you could. I have. I I had some criticisms of how we went about protesting the G20. Um, and I, you know, I I talked about it with people who were doing it. You know, we we I, I wrote about it a little bit. Um, so so it was a contentious thing. It wasn't a united strategic initiative. I don't think. And 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 the results weren't that great. I I I think. But, um, but, but your strategy has to incorporate the presence of opposition. I guess that's the only 
that's the only thing I would say as a summary of a response. <laughs> Really quickly, some very big questions. I'll, I'll start with the, the first one. I've always thought, I mean, it's a huge question. How do we put it into practice? For me, the most important thing that I'm working on now is what I will very uh, uh, quickly call a capital strike. I actually think it's very important that, the, for example, the people in this room have access to a large pools of capital. And yet, we use those pools of capital in order to invest in the very mechanisms which create uh, our, our own misery, and more importantly, those, since we have capital, <laughs> they don't have capital in their misery. And it really confounds me why there isn't a larger movement to take capital away from certain practices and put it somewhere else. And one of the obvious things that I would agree with is local investment. And I've started a local investment cooperative, which I fought three years with the Ontario government to put into practice. They hate the idea. They're going to regulate us out of existence, I'm sure. But I think it's important to push. Uh, in terms of quantification, I actually agree that quantification is important. The question is, and I think of it in terms of the language of impacts. Impact measurement is all through the government. It's all through nonprofits. It's all through everywhere. How do you measure impacts? And people always default because they don't know how to do it. They default to the, the, the problems that we see in quantification. I think there's another way to look at the quantification problem. And while I don't like it, social accounting is one of those means where they start to try and say, how do we measure social value in organizations and actually give it value? Uh, I think their measures are very wrong. I'm working on an impacts project right now. Uh, but it's hard to construct other impacts. The other thing I'll just say is I have a piece out which was mentioned on fair trade. But it's really about what I, a concept that I call ethical value added. And where you actually can institute inside of organizations checks on not just what value you're bringing now, social accounting, but what values you plan to bring. And by instituting, as you can see from my presentation, idea of process <laughs> into the idea of adding ethical value, you actually start to, I think, change the nature of organizations and pull. It doesn't necessarily win <laughs> that pull, but pull organizations away from the sort of econometric ideas and pull it into a social uh, an alternative world, which leads to the social economy experiments. I think the easy thing to say, and it's true, is that there, the good life always includes more than any organization can bring, right? It includes gender equality, it includes good home, all sorts of other things that are really important. However, I think there's a number of examples that I'll, I'll just uh, give you three. Um, first of all, the Kudumbashri movement in Kerala, just because I was just there and visiting them. I think it's very interesting to see the reactions of the people in the movements themselves to being empowered through literacy rates, but also, importantly, in an economic way. So that for those of you that don't know, the Kudumbashri movement is hundreds of thousands of, of women in Kerala who have uh, been organized. And my problem is it's a top-down state process, so I'm suspicious of it. But they are given, as far as I could see with my fellow researchers, relative control over their economic lives as women. And that's an amazing difference, to just to visit those workspaces. And then we were visiting workspaces that weren't organized by them. And the energy and the experience in those places is completely different. The way that people talk about their lives. We've got film and footage. It's really quite interesting. The other is a place that I visited in Kurdistan on the edge of the border with uh, Iraq, where there was a Kurdish women's weaving cooperative. And again, inside of military presence, it was very hard to get in there. But these people live with constant military oppression, bombing, killings. Inside of that space, there's this little factory that has been set up through some Swiss women's money, but to set up this co-op. And inside of that space, it's become the central hub. When I was eating dinner with them on the nights I was there, the whole village came. Everybody was talking. And I think that this provides that kind of counter space, however fragile. They're always afraid that they are going to get hit you know, just to eliminate that. But it was a really interesting example. To move to here, I would talk about the Sumac Worker Co-op, which is in Guelph, which is where I live, which are worker co-ops, especially in the West, provide this good life package, which is that they've built into their very uh, structure, uh, based on Mondragon, actually, not only the idea of incubating more and more economic activity in the region through a centralized fund, which is taken out of, like, the Caja Populaire, but also that the workers have the right to control their own work existence and are encouraged to go out and find other things to do. So a good friend of mine who's there is a part-time filmmaker. And he can book his life accordingly and say, I'm going to work 50% this year because I want to try and develop this part of my life, my art. And then he can come back and say, I want to work 
And again, those aren't perfect examples, but they are examples where that is being realized. And, and as I'll just end with, process is hugely important. That opening up that process makes change. Thank right. you for the excellent questions. Yeah, thanks for that excellent discussion. It's now time to break for lunch. And just for those of you who are maybe new to York, you basically have three options for <laughs> lunch. Um, it's a real culinary adventure. But um, the first option would be the underground restaurant, which is sort of a sit-down place, which is directly east of here. The other option is York Lanes, which is a food court type setup. It's also directly uh, east of here. The third option would be to um, take advantage of the catering food if you want to eat for free, which is just <laughs> to my right over here. If you're looking to go to either the Underground or the York Lanes um, food court, you can ask me for directions. Otherwise, there should be a group of, of people headed in that general direction. So thanks again to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.